Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, the microbiology talk as part of uh, Trinity's Open Day for, for 2013. My name is Shane Dillon, and I'm a, a lecturer in microbiology. And I'm going to um, talk to you about why you should, um, you should think about studying um, the discipline of, of microbiology. So this is where I work, and this is the department I work in, uh, the Moyne Institute of Preventive Medicine, or, or the microbiology department. And you've probably seen this as you walk down by the cricket and the soccer pitches. And you've seen this green roof building. So this is a building that's entirely dedicated to the study of, of microbiology. <laughs> and in fact, has, has a reputation for being one of the best microbiology departments um, in the world. And we, um, we, we study a range of, um, of microbes in this department. And this, um, actual, this, this building was built in, um, in 1952. Um, to um, um, and, and devoted to the study of microbiology, thanks to the help of the Guinness family. Actually, they were generous benefactors um, in, involved in the building of this um, microbiology department in the in the fifties. So, what um, what exactly is microbiology? So, there are a number of um, organisms that we study in the microbiology department, and it's um, broadly defined. The, the, the uh, discipline of microbiology is broadly defined as and um, working on organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So we work on a range of organisms, including bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, um, and, and protozoa. We don't actually work on algae in the microbiology department, but they are um, 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 classified as, as microbes. So you can see here a number of the, the microbial organisms that, are, um, that we work with in the microbiology department. Here's an image of, um, of a virus. You have an image of some E. coli bacterial cells here. You have some protozoa cells here, and you have some um, some yeast cells that we all of these organisms we work with in the, in the microbiology department. So it, it basically it's the study of um, of organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, and you need microscopes to um, to um, to study them. So who was the first microbiologist? Um, and again, this is um, a, a classic example of, of scientific discoveries made by chance. This is a, a, a Dutch um, man called Anton van Leeuwenhoek, and he, he lived in the mid 1600s in, 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 um, in the Netherlands, and he was actually a draper, but he was interested in, in, um, in um, figuring out ways to um, judge the quality of, of the cloth he bought in his drapery business. He also had an interest in lenses, um, and he was able to manufacture lenses. So he um, developed the first microscope in the 1600s. And in fact, when he looked at um, in water samples and things like that, he was able to um, visualize the first bacteria in the 1600s. So he's what, what I would call the first microbiologist, and, and, and he actually invented the first microscope to, to enable him to, to look at um, the first microbes. So we, I, I work on bacteria, and um, bacteria are very small, so hence, hence the name microbiology. And this is just an image I'd like to show you, um, show it to the, um, depict how small these bacteria are. So the bacteria here are highlighted in orange. These E. coli bacteria are in, um, in orange on the tip of, of, of a pin. You can see this um, image that has magnified the tip of a pin, and you can see exactly how small these bacteria are. Where you have hundreds of these bacteria on the, on the top of a, a tiny um, uh, thing such as, such as a pin. So these bacteria are typically, typically five microns long, so that's quite, a, quite a, an, incredible, an incredibly small organism when you consider that the tip of the, of the pin is, is approximately 20 microns across. You would get approximately um, four of these bacteria across the, the tip of the pin at least. So this is one of the bacteria I work on, Salmonella typhimurium, and this is associated with food poisoning. And this is just an image again showing you how, how small these bacteria are. And if you, if you see, it's approximately a micron wide and, and a couple of microns long. So why, um, why study microbiology? Why is microbiology so important? Well, we know that um, everything, on, everything on this planet depends on, on microbes. Um, without microbes, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't certainly wouldn't be around, and um, other life certainly wouldn't be around. <coughs> we know that they're the most um, abundant living matter on, on the planet, so they make up um, approximately 60% of, of the Earth's biomass are, are, are microbes. 
And without their cycling of, of key nutrients, such as carbon and nitrogen, um, the world wouldn't be, um, uh, we wouldn't be able to inhabit this world. So they play a key role in the cycling of, of these key nutrients that we require, and all other animals and, and plants and other life forms require for, for their existence. And in fact, you, um, you probably think about plants generating oxygen, but microbes generate approximately half of the oxygen that we breathe. So they, they have a key role, and everything, everything on the planet depends on, on microbes. And as I said, they, they, um, they live everywhere. In fact, there's, we've, um, uh, microbes have been identified in a range of habitats on the planet, some habitats where no other organisms can live. Certainly, for example, they've been identified, um, we've, um, microbiologists have uh, um, identified bacteria on the ground as far on the ground as 1,500 meters on the ground. Um, microbes can survive in the sky, they can, um, they can live in the clouds, literally. They've been identified in um, um, the Arctic and Antarctic and living in ice. They've been identified in these hydrothermal vents where the temperature is incredibly hot and other organisms certainly wouldn't be able to survive. And they've been identified in, in deep sea vents as well. But more importantly, they help us in so many ways um, that, um, that make our, life, our lives possible. And in fact, I'm going to take you through some of the key ways in which microbes help us to, um, help us to exist. And there are probably some, some um, unusual surprises in here where you wouldn't think that microbes are, are involved. But some of the, maybe the more obvious things are that we know microbes are involved in, say, for example, the production of alcohol. They're involved in the production of cheese. Different microbes are involved in that. But did you know that um, microbes enable cows to eat grass? So the, something in, in, in grass um, called cellulose, the carbohydrate in, in grass is called cellulose. And the cows, in fact, in their digestive system, they don't have the enzymes that allow them to break down cellulose and to extract the, the carbohydrate energy sources from the cellulose. So microbes in, in the gut of the cow, in fact, allow them um, have the enzymes that allow them to break down cellulose and derive nutrients from, from the actual, from the grass, and allow cows to, um, to grow. And then an unusual um, aspect of what, how microbes help us is in the degradation of explosives. So in areas where they keep um, ammunition, you can have TNT leaking out of the ammunition and actually um, um, per, um, is, is an explosive risk. And in these areas where TNT is contaminated with soil, you can have, um, as I said, you can have ex explosions. But we know, we now know that some bacteria are able to break down the TNT. So there's a bacteria called Clostridium and um, Bifermentans, and this is just its Latin name. And um, all of these bacterial species that we work with have, have these Latin names. And it's able to break down the explosive and um, when and use the TNT as an energy source um, during metabolism. And it's able to clear up um, the TNT that's leaked into and leached into the soil. So it provides a, a beneficial effect and, and prevents these, um, these explosions in, in regions where ammunition is kept. So um, you probably don't think of bacteria as playing a role in, in the production of chocolate, but they do in fact when, when you're eating chocolate this Christmas. Um, you, you should think about the fact that um, the chocolate seeds, which come from the cacao tree, um, are, are, um, are retrieved by fermenting them with a number of yeasts and, and bacteria, so lacto lactobacilli, and the Cecobacter are involved in, um, in breaking down the pod of these seeds and uh, allow you to, um, to extract the chocolate from, from the seeds of, of the cacao tree. Well, also, there are examples where um, bacteria have been um, have essentially been revived. So what I call the Stephen Beauty story for bacteria. So in 1995, a number of scientists um, were able to revive um, these bacteria were, that were believed to be between 25 and 40 million years, years old. So they were um, revived from the stomach of a bee that was preserved in tree sap. And this idea led to the, the development of, of Spielberg's Jurassic Park, um, where he created a um, where he got the idea from, from these scientists and he created uh, dinosaurs after their DNA was extracted from, from mosquitoes trapped in the trees. Uh, so these scientists gave uh, Spielberg the idea for, for Jurassic Park. Um, bacteria can also act as insecticides. We, we think sometimes think of bacteria involved in, um, in, in, um, in the rotting of, of fruit and vegetables, but they can also play a, a key role as, as insecticides. 
peptides. So there is a species, um, a bacteria called Bacillus, and it produces um, a number of toxins that are a number of proteins that are, that are toxic to insects. And scientists have now shown that if they transfer these Bacillus genes into crops, um, the crops then produce the toxins which are fatal to um, crop damaging pests and put out and don't um, pose a, a, a health um, risk to humans or um, other um, beneficial um, 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 insects. So they, they only basically kill the, the crop damaging pests. So again, that's just an interesting example of how bacteria are helping us in our, in our, in our daily lives. There are also some examples of um, bacteria that are capable of, of metabolizing caffeine. So this um, soil bacterium, again, Pseudomonas, can metabolize caffeine. And it could, um, so the production of, of um, coffee beans is quite, a, is quite a toxic process. The material left over after separating the coffee beans from the coffee berries is, is a toxic material. And these bacteria, Pseudomonas, um, due to the, may be able to um, metabolize this toxic breakdown product. So these are what I call coffee addicted bacteria and, and they um, prevent um, the, the pollution of, um, of water with this um, toxic material after separating coffee beans from, from coffee berries. I also wanted to show you an example of, of some of the, um, um, in, in, um, in, 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 for example, in palm water, some of the amazing um, microbial life that you can, you can visualize in, in something as simple as palm and lake water. So um, some scientists have, have used a technique called dark field microscopy and allows you to visualize the, these bacteria in their natural environment. And I'll show you some of the, the microbes that are around us in our, in a, for example, in pond water in your, in your garden or lake water. And, and you, you'll see in this video clip, in this short clip, that there are um, a variety of, of um, crustaceans, mosquito larvae and, and other microbes in, in simple pond water. They were just an example of, of some of the microbes that you can um, actually see around us in, in ordinary day situations, so in, in pond water and things like that. The amazing diversity of, of microbes are around us. But um, now, on, now on to, um, to, to humans, as I mentioned, bacteria live everywhere. In fact, there are more bacteria on us than, than human cells. And um, this is just an example of, of what we do when we um, um, we isolate bacteria from a number of, of locations, for example, from earwax, 
you're able to isolate a, a number of bacterial species on, on what we call agar plates here. It's a solid media that we add nutrients to, so agar is extracted from seaweed and solidifies them. Um, and the, it solidifies the, the, the agar and we're able to, to grow bacteria on it. So you, you see that there are a range of bacteria um, from in different locations of the human body. And as we said, bacteria um, outnumber us um, in terms of the number of bacterial cells on us and, and, and inside us compared to human cells. Um, most of the bacteria in fact on us and in, in, inside us are um, friendly bacteria and provide beneficial functions so they um, they colonize the human gut shortly after after birth and, and protect us against a number of diseases. So we know that in, in our guts, uh, friendly E. coli bacteria produce a number of vitamins that we can't produce ourselves, and in return we give them, them food and shelter. And they also break down indigestible carbohydrates in, in a number of things, including vegetables, and provide us with, with the nutrients from, from the breakdown of these and indigestible carbohydrates in return for the food and shelter that we provide them. We're all uh, familiar with the uh, um, friendly bacteria and things like um, in drinks such as Acumel, so lacto lactobacillus um, bacteria provide, um, provide our, our, our known as friendly bacteria and give us this, um, as, as depicted in this image, a healthy uh, overall flow. But um, microbiologists, in fact, are working to understand how these bacteria actually give health benefits and they're known to prevent other bacteria causing us um, infections. But they have a range of, of health benefits and microbiologists are, are studying these and um, this is quite an active area of research in, in microbiology at the moment. So actually, how many friendly bacteria do you have inside you? So this is the number we, we know um, in, inside the typical human person you have approximately a, a thousand trillion bacteria. But that probably doesn't mean much to you. Um, we break it down, it's, 1,000 million, million bacteria, but in fact, if, if, um, maybe if you think of it in terms of weight, you have approximately a, kil a kilogram of bacteria inside you. Um, so if you think of a, a can of baked beans stuffed with these tiny microbes, that will give you um, an idea of actually how many bacteria you have inside you, these friendly bacteria. So we know that the majority of the of bacteria are beneficial to humans, but we also have um, in small cases, we have um, a, a number of bacteria that cause diseases, what are called bacterial pathogens. And these are the ones that grab all of the attention probably because of the disease that they cause. And in fact, in, in microbiology, we have four um, basic shapes for all of these um, different bacterial species. Here you can see images of, of these different types of bacteria. The rod shaped E. coli, um, these copper shaped fibrio cholera. Um, these um, spiral-shaped Campylobacter. You probably heard of MRSA, so that's a bacteria that's um, um, typically associated with outbreaks in hospitals, and it's quite a dangerous one. You might often hear about that in the news. And then you have these um, sphere-shaped Streptococcus bacteria. So, um, with, with with the number of bacterial pathogens out there, and um, you, you may be thinking um, that it's probably amazing. The reason for that, um, the reason I put that statement up is that um, in the past, um, the human life expectancy was quite low in the 1800s, but it's doubled over the past 150 years thanks to a large, um, large effort from, from microbiologists in understanding a number of these bacterial pathogens that cause diseases. So, um, as I said, why has why the life expectancy doubled in the past 150 years? Um, we look at this. Um, look at this table here, if you're looking at the average age of death in the 1800s, you can see that depending on where you, um, where you, what, what kind of person you are in society, so if you're a member of the gentry, um, so, so someone who is rich and you were involved in agriculture, your average um, age of death during the 1800s was approximately 50. Um, this decreased for tradesmen and farmers and was even lower for neighbors and servants, so these were the people who were involved in doing the dangerous jobs. And we're often in, in um, often associate, these dangerous jobs often associate were associated with them um, with bacteria, and they were um, encountering a number of different um, microbes in their day to day life, in their day to day um, work environments, and, and they were quite um, quite dangerous because then we didn't know much about um, um, infection control and how microbes.
how folks call it yet. We know, for example, the average life expectancy in 1848 was, was 40, and that has doubled in the last approximately 150 years to 80 now in Ireland, thanks to the efforts of a number of microbiologists um, in the past um, approximately 150 to 200 years. So what exactly was killing everybody in, in the 1800s? Uh, 1800s and 1900s. If we look at the leading causes of death in the USA in 1900, we see that um, four of the leading causes of death were at work um, by bacterial um, um, infections. So things such as diphtheria, diarrheal disease, TB, and pneumonia were killing huge um, percentages of the population in the 1900s. If we look more recently, we see that only one of these um, leading causes of death is still a problem in, a, in modern society, so we see, still see that quite a large percentage of the population died from, from pneumonia or from elderly patients in hospitals from died from pneumonia. So why have we um, eradicated some of these other um, leading causes of death? Um, pre, pre, as I said, pre-1850 we knew very little about microbiology and what were causing these diseases, and it was believed that um, these diseases were transmitted by a poisonous vapor on a mist in the air. For example, something like cholera was believed to be transmitted in the wind. And at the time, um, we, as I said, we had very little um, understanding of microbiology and what was causing these diseases. This is an example of a, a notice from, from New York in the 19th, 1832, where their um, health advice consists of um, from, uh, preventing getting cholera and both, um, includes avoid getting wet, keep warm and don't sleep in a draft and avoid alcohol. So in other words, we didn't know that a bacteria was causing um, cholera. And if we're able to control this bacteria, then we'll be able to prevent um, cholera. It wasn't until some microbiologists came along in the mid-1800s, and Robert Koch is one of these key microbiologists, who were the founders of public health and discovered some of the, the causal agents of some of these key diseases. And for example, in tuberculosis, we discovered the bacteria that causes it. And in cholera, and in anthrax, we um, discovered all of the, the uh, causal agents for these um, important, um, important diseases in, in the late 1800s. So, as I said, these diseases no longer threaten humanity because microbiologists in the 1800s and 1900s um, discovered the causal agents. And we now we know what the, the causal agents, for example, for of smallpox, which is a virus, or a virus, and things like typhoid, which were big problems. discovered the causal agents and how to combat them. Um, we, we now have vaccines against um, smallpox, so smallpox essentially has been eradicated in the 1980s. And we have vaccines against um, polypoly and we have improved sanitation, so um, uh, have, have helped to um, combat these, all of these um, diseases. And for example, with diarrhea, we know that food safety and sanitation are key as well. So if we look at um, the mortality from infection and in the last, in the last century, we've seen a, a steady decline in the in the number of deaths from infectious agents um, due to due to um, research from microbiologists. So we um, fluoridated the water. We saw a gradual reduction in cholera, uh, but this kind of flu pandemic led to a spike in um, the um, number of mortality rate, the mortality rate in the, um, 1918, because um, approximately 100. 100 million people died from the Spanish flu. Um, the introduction of antibiotics in the 1940s led to a, a reduction in mortality rates as well. And then more recently, we could get these uh, vaccines and reduce um, mortality rates as well. So hygiene is a key thing for um, um, and again, it's something simple and can prevent a number of these infections. So if you're, um, one of the key ways to prevent the flu, for example, is to, to, to wash your and there are some examples, more recent examples of, of um, bacterial outbreaks. Um, for example, um, a number of years ago, there was an outbreak of E. coli associated with bean sprouts. So did you know that, that bean sprouts were killed? In fact, it killed a number of um, people in, in Germany. 
major types of bisphalite, enteroagricative bisphalite and enterohemorrhagic bisphalite, which both cause different diseases and they have a number of them uh, of killed in their arsenic that allow them to, to cause these diseases. But the E. coli, German E. coli outbreak strain was associated with Adam, was associated with Adam, a combination of, of both of these um, tools from these two strains, or essentially was a hybrid of these two strains, and created this, um, this hybrid strain that was extremely um, dangerous for, um, for a number of these patients and had a couple of summer results. So what, what happens um, in the German outbreak hybrid strain? So you have a, had a fusion, as I said, of, of two E. coli strains, essentially, and they require, um, acquired a toxin, a virus toxin, which um, was introduced into the bacteria and it led to this uh, outbreak strain that was both bacterial and, and toxic. So it was quite a dangerous combination in this um, German Ebola outbreak strain. So it, it led to um, over 3,000 3, cases of, of, um, of this Ebola O1, O1 uh, 04 strain were associated with um, outbreaks in Germany in the summer of 2011, and in fact it killed 50 people, and a number of these individuals had um, kidney damage to their presumption of the toxin bacteria. But where did the E. coli strain come from? Uh, the blame game started with the Spanish cucumbers, it wasn't there. Uh, was it the German left that they were eating? No. Um, it, as I said, it turned out to be these um, German bean sprouts. Um, in fact, the, the seeds that um, were used to produce these bean sprouts were, were grown in a most hygienic way and were contaminated with the C. coli strain. So I mentioned that bacteria have a huge impact on humans, but can, can these diseases be treated? In fact, they can. Um, we discovered um, antibiotics in the 1920s, and this led to a wave of um, the discovery of antibiotics in the 30s and 40s. And if, for example, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928, by accident, it was produced by, um, by a, a penicillin mold and was able to kill bacteria he observed in his lab. And that led to a, a golden age in the um, identification of, of um, these um, antibiotics. But more recently, we're seeing that a number of these bacteria are, are resistant to these antibiotics. They acquire the genes that make them resistant to the antibiotics. And um, for example, the, one, the German E. coli outbreak strain is resistant to most antibiotics. And a number of um, hostile bacterial strains are because they've been um, there's, they've been um, growing in environments where antibiotics are overused. They acquire the genes that make them resistant and enable them to grow in the presence of these antibiotics. For example, things like MRSA, the, the Super Bowl, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a, is a big problem in hospitals because a number of these MRSA Super Bowl are resistant to a range of antibiotics that we use to treat infections. So we're relying really on the, on the next generation of microbiologists to um, identify and, and uh, develop these new antibiotics to meet the challenge of, of um, new pathogens that are emerging all the time. We want new microbiologists to understand how viruses and bacteria cause disease. And this is just, um, just a, 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 an image of the attack of the killer bacteria and encouraging people to become microbiologists because at the end of the day these are the, the microbiologists are the people for these new diseases that are emerging. So I would encourage you to, to come downstairs and talk to anybody in the microbiology stand. Um, the way into microbiology obviously is in the science PR071. Um, for the first couple of years you get a grounding in science and then um, if, you, if you enjoy microbiology, if you enjoy the lectures, encourage a portion of you specialize in microbiology. But as I said, I would encourage you to come down and talk to anybody at the stand. And I would, I would encourage everyone, anyone who is here who has a general interest to apply for science and then see what you like at the end of the second year and you specialize then in the third and fourth year. So thank you for your attention.